An early Lent, an early Ash Wednesday means an early Easter. You know that. But it's good to be together this night, and I'm grateful that we come together to worship and begin this Lenten journey together. This series and this season will be inspired by the Jeffrey window, which is now in dark. Sort of like the Gospel of Matthew in secret, right? You can't see it tonight, but it, it is an inspiring window telling the story of Jesus and our faith in him from the beginning. And so when the light sheds again, in other words, every other service that will be together in this season, you will see the frames of these windows, the panels. But tonight, I want you to take a look because the panel we are looking at tonight is this one on your cover, and you will see it, the different panels, each time we worship in the focus of our story of Jesus. Tonight, it is go and sin no more. One more thing, for those who do not know, this is a beautiful story of gratitude and grace. The Jeffrey window is to honor the Jeffrey family. The Jeffrey family gave a large contribution to the building of this church in 1931, but the congregation gave the window to the Jeffrey family in gratitude and thanks for all they had done to help us build First Church. So the Jeffrey window to me is a window of pure grace and a window of pure beauty. As we come together to begin this season, this story will continue, as I've said, and we'll also study together. We have Henry Nouwen's book, Following Jesus, Finding Our Way Home in an Age of Anxiety, which probably could have been written today. <laughs> it's very timely. And I encourage you to join in the book studies that we'll be announcing and uh, in homes or on your own, but also to join in worship each week in these small groups and be energized and curious as you engage prayers to Jesus and meditations on Jesus this season in your daily discipline of prayer. The focus is Jesus. For example, who is Jesus to you? How does he impact your relationship with God and with others? How do you talk with him? How do you walk with him? How do you follow him as a disciple? Many more connections are possible with Jesus through writing and music and so much more. So we step into Lent. Join me on the journey with Jesus. Would you join me as we open with prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. I think about Jesus all the time. Now you may say that's because you're a pastor. Well, no, actually it's because I love Jesus. Sometimes I reflect on him all day long. I wonder, what was Jesus thinking when he said this, when he did this? What was moving in his heart that moved him to this action rather than another action? What were his motivations for the teachings he gave, for the healings he performed, for the miracles, for the message? How did he do it? Why did he do it? What was he doing and who was Jesus of Nazareth? In the words of Jesus Christ Superstar, why did you choose such a backward time and such a strange land? If you'd come today, you could have reached a whole nation. Israel in 4 BC had no mass communication. Don't you get me wrong. Don't you get me wrong. I, I just want to know. I think we're all like that. We want to know so much about Jesus as we walk with him. In the middle of all of these questions, a woman is caught in adultery and dragged before us tonight. Found in John 7, 53 through 8, 11, and in the panel that we have in our bulletin, there on the Temple Mounts, 
mount. The crowd calls for her stoning to death because of her sin. In the midst of the murderous roar of the crowd, Jesus kneels down in silence. He writes something on the ground, and we don't know what it is. People have been filled with conjecture through the ages, but we don't know. And now the crowd turns on him and pummels him with more questions. So first her, now him, will it be the stoning of two and not one? So he stands and he asks, who among you is without sin? Let that person cast the first stone. They are all sinners and they all know it. They all leave. So Jesus is left alone in this public place with the woman. He turns to her and kneels once again and asks her as he looks in her eyes, woman, where are they now? Has no one condemned you? And she answers, no one, sir. And he replies, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Go and sin no more. Forgiveness. What is it about Jesus? While John the Baptist preaches to sinners and baptizes them, and while other spiritual healers like Hania Bendosa in the first century exorcised evil spirits from people, Jesus identified with people. He goes out of his way to mix socially with beggars and tax collectors and prostitutes and adulterers, with the poor, with people with disabilities and the blind. The scandal of this in his time is immense. He knows that. He knows exactly what he is doing. He chooses over and over and over again to identify with those who everyone else has rejected. Why? Because he loves them. He loves them. He loves all of them, just as he loves all of us. How about you? How do you identify with these folks? Do you seek out the forgotten and forsaken ones? Or do you join with the crowd and pick up stones? It might be verbal stones or physical ones and cast those stones when the atmosphere is just right and the temperament has risen. Do you join the crowd or silently grant your approval or do you drop your stones knowing that like everyone else around you, like me, like you, we're all sinners? Better yet, do you like Jesus engage with the people, the persons who everyone else is pointing at or threatening and stand with them because they are threatened. One year ago, our whole season of Lent was focused on forgiveness. So here we are beginning Lent this year with Jesus and forgiveness. It will expand as we go on, but on Ash Wednesday last year, I said forgiveness is not too hard to understand but it is surprisingly easy to misunderstand. Forgiveness is not something that you have to accomplish or that you deserve. Forgiveness is always present, although we don't always recognize it and don't always accept it. Forgiveness is part of the present moment, every moment of every day. It is the divine face of God, which our divine love 
the God of our lives offers each of us. Forgiveness is a fresh start. It's a new beginning. There is always uh, no matter that happens or will happen that will keep God away from us. Through forgiveness, an option for fresh start and new beginning is offered to each of us and everyone in every moment. Forgiveness takes from the past moment and presents hope for change in the present moment. The past is real. It cannot be changed, but our relationship to the past can be changed. The first change we may need to consider is our memory of the past. We have forgotten the real past, let's be honest. What memory we do have of the past, memories of what we are, what we thought was real at the time, but our thinking is always limited. It is always a mix of somewhat true and somewhat not true. However flawed our memory is, the real past is completely gone, and the real past is already forgiven by God because of God's grace and pardon. A fresh start is at hand. Perhaps the fresh start will include remembering more of the real past. And when we remember it, perhaps we will laugh, perhaps we will cry, perhaps we'll say, wow, I was spot on almost, or I was completely mistaken. Such self-observation is good for each of our souls. I know it's been good for mine. Hopefully, such a cleansing clears the way for a fresh start that's always open to us. And that fresh start requires no admission fee. There's no down payment. There's no begging that's necessary. There's no price to pay for the fresh start except for the consequence of taking on this humble new start for our lives. And it always is good to clear a path for the healing ahead. The things we carry and the things we let go of and allow Jesus to heal will determine a lot about how our lives move forward. Making choices between forgiveness or unforgiveness really does matter. When we forgive, we set ourselves free from the demons of bitterness. It is that simple and that hard. When Miami native Chris Carrier was 10, a former family employee abducted him, assaulted him, shot him in the head, and left him to die in the Everglades. But Chris survived. In the years that followed, he lived daily with the fears and the insecurities and the trauma of knowing that his abductor was still at large recognizing that living in fear and staying angry would never change anything, Chris found a way to move on. Many years passed, 20 years passed, and he received a phone call that changed his life again. The police called him to tell him that an elderly man at a local nursing home named David McAllister had confessed to being his abductor. Chris went to visit him the following day. He saw that David's body was ruined by drugs and alcohol, that his soul was a wreck, that he was blind, that he was facing death with only his regrets and his separations from God and the people of his life to keep him company as he rotted from within. At the end of their time together, David reached out for Chris's hand and he said to him, I am sorry. As he spoke, something came over Chris, like a wave, he said. As he later said, no one should face the end without family or friends or the joy of life or without hope and I couldn't do anything but offer him friendship and forgiveness. And so it began. Chris would visit David as often as he could, usually bringing his wife and his two daughters. 
They would spend hours together reading and talking and singing and praying. And as they did, the old man's hardness melted away. If Jesus is real, if the cross and resurrection are not just historic happenings, but present realities that move us, that change us, that alter our ways of being and interacting, then when we celebrate Easter on March 31st, and when we celebrate Easter every Sunday, because every Sunday is to be a reflection of Easter, the healing power of God's forgiveness will be real also. It will be at work in us and in our world. So let's try it. Let's try forgiveness. Let's put on forgiveness. Let's wear it. Let's see how it fits. Just see how it feels. Let's step into it. Let's live into it. I say this because I've been doing these things out of a commitment that I made 150 days ago. On September 17th, I preached a sermon on forgiveness. I said, as the scripture said, that Jesus said, forgive 77 times or 490 times, whichever works for you. I chose 490 because I am so hard-headed and I am such a slow learner. So I needed to take Jesus' long path to healing. So I've been doing this for 150 days. I get up each morning and I try to practice what I preached and preach. Since September 18th, I've taken on a daily discipline of forgiveness. I'm working at forgiving for 490 days in a row. So each day I get up and I pray a prayer of forgiveness. I name the people that I feel have hurt me. I name them aloud before God through the specifics of things that cling to me and I find this powerful exercise begins to wash things away. To forgive someone 490 days in a row, which in my case, in case you're counting, will be January 20th, 2025, when I'm done. And then I'll probably just begin again. <laughs> really touches deep the meaning and action of forgiveness. I have good days and I have bad days, but every day I'm working on it. The grudges, the judgments, the memories, the fears, the insecurities, the stories I carry against people change and lessen each day. 490 days of forgiveness is Jesus' way of working on me. I offer it and commend it to each one of you. The discipline of daily forgiving has altered my perception of so many things and so many people. In the same spirit of forgiveness, I ask your forgiveness this night. I ask if there are words that I have spoken that have hurt you or left unspoken that you've waited to hear. Any actions or lack of actions, any responses or lack of responses that I have said or done. Our time is winding down and I am truly sorry, I am truly sorry for any way that I have hurt you. We have four, 249 days left. I knew that you knew that number. <laughs> we have 249 days left together. I ask if you could find it in your heart to forgive me for all the wrongs that I've brought upon you and that you have experienced or perceived. Again, I'm sorry. I'm open to time to sort anything out that you carry that needs to be dealt with before I'm gone. Please don't carry them forward. If it's with me, let it be with me. If it's with others, let it be with others, but let it go somehow or another. And don't carry it because it may hurt others in the future, including yourself. As a commitment to my being open, Thanks to my colleague and friend, Joanna, 
I will be saving Thursday mornings beginning March 14th and continuing on through October. Each Thursday morning, my door will be open unless you're in there and we need privacy. So whatever it is that you wish to bring, to share, good or bad or otherwise, that time is for you. But any time is for you. As I close, I am reminded by these words from Dietrich Bonhoeffer that came to me in reading last Lent. It has a special place in my heart and daily prayers. Part of my daily prayer is this, to remember that Christianity is forgiveness, nothing more and nothing less. Christianity is forgiveness. To not forgive is to not be a Christian. To fail to forgive is to fail to live into the baptism that you were called to at whatever age you were called. To be unforgiving is a choice not to be with Jesus. So I want all of us to forgive because it will help us walk with him. As we step into these 40 days of Lent, we will grow closer to Jesus, closer than we ever imagined. And I want you to imagine in your mind's eye right now that when the crowd had parted from all who wished to do harm to the woman, there were just two, just two, Jesus and the woman, eye to eye, knee to knee. Let's start today with the cross of Christ calling us to be truly who we're meant to be. May each one of us be forgiven and forgiving as the window has said to us for 93 years, go and sin no more. Amen.